Hello and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. I am your host Pushpendra Mehta. Joining me today are Paul Galloway, Senior Director, Advisory Services at Strategic Treasurer, and Ben Poole, Writer at CTM File. Thank you, Paul and Ben, for taking the time to share your thoughts with us on topics that impact corporate treasury and the society at large. Great to be here, Bush. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. It's time to get some deeper insights from you on our topics for today, namely cash forecasting, generative artificial intelligence, counterparty risk concerns, and JP Morgan coming to the rescue of First Republic Bank. Our audience can read these articles and also research content more deeply by visiting ctmfile.com or by following the links in our show notes. Let's get started with the discussion. Our first story for today is about cash forecasting. According to the 2023 Treasury Perspective Survey Report produced by Strategic Treasurer and underwritten by TD Bank, this marks the fifth year that cash forecasting has been the top area that Treasury spend the most time on. Paul, while security remains the top concern, according to the survey, Cash forecasting is one of the areas which occupies a lot of time for treasurers. In your viewpoint, why has treasury devoted more time to cash forecasting than any other area of cash and treasury management in the past five years? Yeah, Push, I think uh, there's several things that uh, come to mind. I'll go into a couple of different pieces, all tied to how Treasury views cash today, what the demands are relative to way, to the way it, it used to be. I think corporations, you know, have come to realize that Treasury departments are more than just the blocking and tackling and moving cash. They realize that Hey, just having a bunch of cash in an account at a bank isn't necessarily optimal and that they didn't always appreciate uh, their access to liquidity, uh, nor uh, did they fully appreciate or they optimize to get the greatest yield on the cash that they do hold. So I think those three things come into play, but there's, there's a few others that make cash forecasting real important from a treasury perspective and what the cash forecasting can help organizations do is detect anomalies. So you can see when there's something that comes through relative to what you expected and be able to trace it down to whether it's something that is legit or real or whether it's something where, um, Somebody has uh, in either inadvertently or on purpose moved cash that shouldn't have happened. So visibility to cash is extremely important. Uh, having a forecast to benchmark that visibility is really important as well. It helps you with the fraudulent activity. It helps detect. And of course, the sooner you can detect, the greater ability to recover that cash. Uh, so speed matters. And uh, in today's environment, we have, we're seeing right now, FedNow is coming out. It's instant payments. Real-time payments have been out from the consortium banks for a while here in the U.S. Instant payments, instantaneous movement of cash 24-7 all year long is going to become more prevalent uh, with that kind of speed. If you don't have something uh, in place to say, this is what I expect and something happens. It's on a weekend. It's two o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping and you don't have checks and balances in place to control that. Uh, you, you may end up with a loss that you didn't expect to have. Forecasting is more important. What we're seeing is that 
providers, whether it's banks or it is outside uh, third party vendors that provide treasury management systems or systems that give visibility to cash is they're utilizing or incorporating artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now we're still relatively new in this area. Not that the concepts haven't been out for a while. The deployment and use of this technology for forecasting is still relatively new. So there's some kinks, I think, still to work out along the way. But you're seeing more and more of the leaders in the industry that are providing this. And I think over time, this is going to be a real valuable tool for treasury teams uh, from forecasting perspective and the ability to reconcile and understand if something happened that shouldn't have. Ben would love your thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, Paul hit on a number of uh, really good points there. And uh, kind of, uh, I was get looking at my notes as Paul was giving his answer, and I was ticking off all the different things I was going to say. One of the reasons why cash flow forecasting is perpetually sort of the number one focus for treasurers is it doesn't matter sort of what company you're talking about, if it's one that barely forecasts at all through to uh, those with a very sophisticated forecasting operation, there's always more that you can do because no forecast is ever going to be 100% accurate. There's always something you might have missed off or something that's, you know, cyclical, seasonal. It's always something that you can work at. And it's so important uh, in terms of the overall cash management approach of treasurers. That's why it's almost like the uh, the car in the garage that you can always you you can always tinker with and and add more value to by doing so. And uh, the AI point uh, that Paul made is is really exciting. I think in terms of the move towards a more real time treasury footing that we've been talking about previously on this podcast push, and uh, you know the need to act quickly and more often is so important for treasurers and just having technology there that can te help take the load off to act within sort of set parameters to this real-time data that is becoming increasingly exposed to the corporate treasury department really helps enable uh, the buildup of the most precise picture possible of an organization's cash flow. And of course, there's a lot of banks and third parties are very interested in this space from the other side, because it's a great opportunity for them to embed themselves with their treasury clients and uh, maybe make a, a little markup on the on the agreements they've got with them. So for example, we, we ran a story in, uh, in today's industry roundup on CTM file about City and uh, the treasury cloud platform uh, TIS partnering uh, to allow joint clients to apply the latter's cash forecasting and working capital management tools with their city accounts. So that's just one example of uh, of how could sort of technology and third party providers are, are driving what's available for treasurers. You know, a treasurer doesn't need to be uh, an expert in AI to uh, to set all this up. That it, for those that aren't at that level of sophistication, there are other entry points that they can uh, look to in their journey. So I think it's, yeah, it's just a, co a constantly evolving and uh, constantly updating uh, area for treasurers and one that is so important throughout the rest of their operations. Yeah, I think that's spot on, Ben. It's one of those things where something that was really not thought of as uber important has been brought forward. And not only organizations or treasury departments, but it's your banking partners, it's third-party vendors that are realizing, hey, this stuff matters and we need to get this right because the world's ever evolving and uh, we're not evolving along with it and utilizing the tools that are available out there. We're going to be in an uncompetitive position and perhaps even worse. So uh, it's it's Super important. The survey shows that I don't see that changing in the near term. And even something like, uh, you know, the interest rate environment that we've been in in the past year or so, you know, if you don't know how much cash you've got coming in approximately, you're at a disadvantage because you don't know how much cash, you know, in your short term bucket, for example, you can actually then invest in, say, money market funds that are showing uh, these great returns of late. So it, it really affects every single area of corporate treasury management. Sure does. 
I couldn't agree more with you, Ben and Paul. And uh, moving forward from one important area, cash forecasting to another one, perhaps going to be extremely important in the near future, uh, which is generative AI. This story merits discussion and revolves around generative artificial intelligence or generative AI, which is a type of AI that generates or produces new outputs like text, audio, video, images, code, and simulations from existing content or data. With its potential uses and opportunities for organizations and its executives, generative AI is here to stay. In a recent survey by KPMG of 300 global C-suite and senior executives, almost two-thirds of the 225 U.S. executives surveyed in the last two weeks of March this year believe generative AI will have a high or extremely high impact on their organizations in the next three to five years, far above every other emerging technology. Ben, with generative AI evolving at a breakneck pace, and expected to disrupt every functional area and industry. What, in your opinion, are the main benefits and key risks or concerns that generative AI brings to corporate treasury and or society at large? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think we've all heard an awful lot about ChatGPT uh, in the past months, um, which is uh, you know one sort of vaunted example of, of such generative AI. I think when you look at uh, finance and w- what sort of role it can play here, uh, there's, I'd say, three sort of applications that stand out. There's conversational finance, so like chatbots and voice assistants that can uh, perform tasks and transactions as directed by customers. So this could, uh, you know, check your balances. It could even make payments for treasurers or possibly even give financial advice. So that's one area. Financial analysis, I think, stands out as another very important area that generative AI can have a big impact on. You know, it can analyze financial data and reports and information at scale uh, through large language models, which in turn allows it to produce insights, even recommend strategies and help with benchmarking. And I know that recently there was a Bloomberg report that JP Morgan is using chat GPT to an- analyze Federal Reserve speeches, for example. So I think that's a really good example of how it can uh, be used to uh, sort of uh, give that analysis and then sort of the next steps from that analysis. And then there's also, uh, I believe it's called synthetic data generation, uh, which is all about synthetic training data, which is produced by the generative AI, uh, which can be used to inform and improve financial models. And also, uh, for example, ensure compliance with data privacy regulations as one example. So anywhere where you need to sort of make sure that you're you're in the you're in the right, you're compliant with the regulation. That's another area where you can sort of test against that. So that those are sort of three areas I, I'd sort of highlight as what we're seeing is quite early use cases. And uh, obviously some of those might apply more to banks perhaps, but I think there's uh, there's definitely areas where treasurers can look at in all three of those as to what might be possible for them. And again, it comes down to, is it something that the treasurer is working on themselves, building in-house, or are these sort of uh, where you're going to see solutions coming f- into the market directed at treasurers from. So it's an exciting time at the moment while all this sort of bubbles up. Chat uh, GPT certainly brought this type of AI to the forefront. And uh, given all the chatter and all the comments around this and use of it today, it's clearly disruptive. So it's not going anywhere. And so the question is, how will it be used? how will organizations use it? And then once you think about how they will use it and what this uh, type of AI actually does, then I think, you know, comments around security really come into play. So I, I really hope that the next steps that we see along the way with this technology is security is looked at very closely in this survey brings that out. It talks about the risks associated with using this technology. I want to make sure before I utilize it, that I understand what it does, what it doesn't do. What are the weaknesses or the strengths? 
I think you're seeing in the survey results that uh, executives are thinking of these things. They're like, well, you know, I don't want to be last. But I'm not sure if I want to be first. And so they're sitting on the sidelines right now and you have early adopters, which you do with disruptive technology. You got people who are willing to take the risk. They're going to jump in right away because they want to take advantage of it. And there can be advantage. So you can leave competitors behind by taking advantage of something like this. You need to understand what the risks are associated with doing that. And the people sitting on the sidelines are waiting for, okay, is something bad going to happen? Let's see. Okay, if it happens, all right, good thing I didn't do it. If it doesn't happen, then it's like, okay, what controls are in place? Oh, they have these controls in place now. Now they're putting some you know, belt and suspenders around this, and I can feel more comfortable that, hey, if I utilize it, I may not be as uh, at as much risk. And I think that's what we're seeing with these executive executives is they're going to sit on the sidelines. They're going to watch for a while. Um, once they've seen enough and they've under, understand enough in terms of what those gaps are, and how they're being closed, then I think we'll see uh, greater adoption rates. But somebody's got to go out there and utilize it before we know what's wrong with it, because we don't know. And I'm sure the creators don't necessarily know everything that might be wrong with it either, because um, until it's utilized in its full capacity, how would you know? You might hypothesize that it could be this, this, or this, but not actually know it could be something completely different that you haven't thought of. Somebody sitting on the wings trying to figure out how can I utilize this technology in a bad way? Because you know there's people out there doing that. The question is, is what does that look like? We should have people counter to that, working on that today. Risk management, what can go wrong? How do you mitigate it? And we should note as well, I think what you, uh, Push said we're recording on the 2nd of May today. So we had the news today that um, the so-called godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, is leaving Google. And he's sort of left with a, a warning about the uh, future risks of AI. Uh, one quote that I read uh, from him was, it's hard to see how you can prevent the bad actors from using it for bad things. Uh, so that's obviously speaks to a little bit what you were saying and also in the broader context about how uh, how fraudulent individuals might be uh, looking to use this sort of technology as well. So another another area where there's uh, there's definitely advantages that you can see, but also uh, risks that need to be mitigated and managed as well. Absolutely. Can I uh, ask both of you a follow-up question? Because both of you raised some very pertinent points, particularly when it came to the downside or the risks or concerns around generative AI. Apart from cybersecurity, there are other risks, privacy, plagiarism, intellectual property rights, misinformation, bias, including job security, perhaps. And of course, these are just some of the risks we have, um, you know, we have, we're trying to discuss is the, including these risks or any other risks that come to your mind. What do you think, um, you know, could affect finance and treasury the most? Where I think it can affect, uh, finance and treasury the most would be around disinformation or misinformation and fraud. I think these are the areas that I would be concerned about when it comes to either treasury or finance. So think about somebody utilizing this technology to generate, quote unquote, a business, whether it's real or not. We would know if they utilized AI to do that, to, to raise capital in the form of maybe a Ponzi scheme or something else to defraud people or to utilize uh, the AI technology to backdoor uh, into a company's systems and steal money, or just flat out generate text information that may mislead or lead people to believe in something that uh, isn't true. So misinformation, disinformation, I think it becomes, we already see that today. It happens in social media all the time. We hear it from you know, even our politicians, it's uh, our media, 
are, you know, there's all kinds of areas where this, this happens and it's, it doesn't mean that all these things are bad. It just means that this is happening. So I think for organizations in treasury and finance trying to ferret out, uh, misinformation, disinformation requires them to, it's going to require them to do more research to ensure that they have an accurate picture of what, um, is being uh, informed or presented to them. I think it also uh, emphasizes the importance of people as well within the organization, having the people, uh, you know, of expertise in whichever department. So in the treasury department, having someone that understands that, you know, well, that's not a regular payment or that's not a regular cash flow that I'd see. We don't have a company in that particular jurisdiction. Uh, You know, just having that knowledge, and uh, having the checks and balances in place to uh, ensure that you're not overexposed to something that could lead to trouble of that respect, I think is really important to uh, to acknowledge. Those are great words and great pieces of advice. And I hope our audience is paying particular attention to these wise words. Uh, our next news item for today that Wharton's discussion pertains to corporate counterparty risk concerns predating the recent bank failures. Even before the banking turmoil sparked by Silicon Valley Bank's failure, 80% of corporate treasury organizations responding to ICD's 2023 client survey said they were concerned about bank and other counterparty concentration risks. Paul, in light of the banking crisis, what are the key counterparty risks that corporate treasury should focus on or try to mitigate? There's a lot of counterparty risks that a treasury department faces today. And so uh, we'll take banks first since since that was mentioned. Banks were mentioned first, so we'll start with them. Obviously, with banks today, we've seen some failures, some quite significant ones. I fully expect that we're actually probably going to see some more, but they, they're they most likely going to be smaller regional or local banks that may fail. Being the economist type person that I am, I am not a fan of moral hazard, but unfortunately, moral hazard was unleashed in 08, 09 during the Great Recession and it isn't going away. And we've seen evidence of that banks consuming other banks. JP Morgan got a great deal on First Republic, and we'll talk about that later, but they got a great deal. SVB, Signature Bank, these banks that have failed. Go across the pond and talk about Credit Suisse being consumed, you know, by RBS. These are counterparty risk businesses. Banks are. And it's built on an establishment of trust between the bank and the consumer, the depositor, the, the people or organizations that deposit cash at these banks. It's a trust that Banks are going to manage the counterparty risk in the sense that they aren't going to make ill-advised loans. They aren't going to engage in risky loans. They aren't going to put their eggs in one basket, you know, jumbo loans for First Republic. They're not going to do these types of things. But the reality is, is that they're actually incented right now to do that. So the counterparty risk of banks is real. So you need to understand as um, a treasurer that you probably want to have, while you might have a main concentration bank that you utilize, you're going to have other banks that you utilize as well. So you can't have just one bank relationship. It needs to be diversified. And you need to ask the right questions so that you understand the bank's portfolio, so you understand what the risks are in place. It works both ways. They're taking a risk on you when you seek credit from the bank. And it's vice versa. You're taking a risk that, hey, you're making a deposit here that's above the FDIC insurance, that you're going to have access to that cash and liquidity when you need it. So there is real counterparty risks associated with the bank. So the other types of risks that treasurers face are you know, vendor risks that mm-hmm. the vendors are going to be able to deliver on the technology 
that you are utilizing, that the downtime is going to be minimized if something bad happens. In the instance of business continuity or disaster recovery plan, that you're able to continue to function through other avenues, whether it's going back to phone calls and faxes or portal platforms or other types of ways to utilize systems. You have workarounds so that you can still conduct your business in a timely fashion in a secure way. So there's counterparty risks associated with those vendors. You know, and obviously there's other counterparties just with that you utilize to run your business, whether it's, uh, you know, it's somebody that is distributing for you a product. That's a counterparty. Um, it's a supply vendor, somebody in a supply chain, you manufacture something and you have counterparty risks associated with them. Are they going to deliver on time? Are they going to fail because uh, they don't manage their credit well? And so they're not able to get the materials they need to deliver to you. These kinds of things are counterparty risks that are, that are real. Looking at those exposures are real. When you think of uh, the investment side of things, treasurers utilize counterparties for investments or for hedging, whether it's interest rates or FX hedges. You know, there's a risk associated with counterparties there. You make investments in money market mutual funds, mutual funds, or short-term bonds, or maybe overnight repos, or securities lending. The, all these types of activities involve counterparties where there's risks. And so a treasurer has a lot of counterparty risks they have to manage and oversee, and it requires um, a savvy team, and it requires effort to manage that risk. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, we had the example of how treasurers and corporates are looking to diversify, particularly on the short-term investment side, back in March when the banking turmoil, I suppose, was at its peak, uh, which uh, Crane data uh, revealed that March was the third best month for inflows into money market funds of all time. I think it was $345 billion dollars went into money market funds just in March alone. And uh, on the flip side of that, deposits at the biggest 25 commercial banks, the US still grew that month. They were up 18 billion, but 212 billion uh, was wiped off the accounts of smaller banks. So it just shows, you know, a sort of mass movement uh, that was occurring there for maybe security was top of mind, but also maybe uh, some were a little bit caught out by the situation and had to react on the fly a little bit. Interestingly, in the US, there was a report in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago that suggests another cloud on the horizon for those that have invested in money market funds now. And this one is stemming from the debt ceiling crisis, where the report was saying that, uh, you know, much of these inflows have been pouring into government money market funds that invest significantly in short term treasury debt. And uh, these are typically very easy to buy and sell. But the standoff in Congress could easily stifle that type of transaction for Treasury bills, meaning that money market funds can then face significant volatility and potential losses. So uh, uh, that's I think that's just highlights the point around diversification, really. And like you can't you can't just go from one to the other. You need to have like a sophisticated portfolio. And th this is just thinking about short term investments. So it's a sort of a, a thought that should be applied across treasury management really i think so uh the uh, obviously the thing with the uh, the debt ceiling in the us still isn't uh, sorted <laughs> that's still uh, problematic at the moment and i think that issue that was noted in the ft could be alleviated very quickly with an agreement uh, between the white house and congress on the new debt limit because uh, then obviously the treasury can issue a ton of bills and uh, money funds can buy these bills and not uh, have to rely on uh, the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility, for example, which is also getting systemically full. <laughs> so there's there's a lot to take into account. And obviously, we've still not had that agreement. So it's just uh, don't, don't just think that money market funds are a safe haven, come what may. You know, education is important and just keeping keeping an eye on the news as well. Yeah, I think that's an important point on uh, money market funds. 2A7 funds, they're, they're stable NAV, but that means they still float. They tend not to move too much for government. Treasuries, you know, are fixed. 
those are fixed. Those treasury funds are fixed, but the government, they float. Uh, prime funds, they float more. Yeah. You know, I experienced issues with prime funds when COVID hit and everybody started getting liquid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were experiencing some unrealized losses on the prime funds because of uh, what was happening in the markets at the time. But what was really interesting, we weren't the only company. We became really liquid. I had a lot of liquidity when COVID hit. People got spooked and all of a sudden it was like, man, make sure you got cash. Well, we were pouring it into money market funds. It was a significant amount. So we had significant inflows to these funds, you know, so it's not the first time we've seen this. We have seen this before, but we had significant inflows there. What's really interesting is you think back to 08, 09, too big to fail. Well, these tier one banks are, you know, they're too big to fail. Systemic risks, right? So um, what do depositors do? They're smart enough, savvy enough to say, hey, Let's go to the big banks. You know, it was really interesting to see that there are two dynamics going on at the same time, increase in government money market funds and a flow of inflow of deposits or increase of deposits into the tier one banks. It's interesting to see these dynamics. If you think people aren't paying attention, just look at the flows. They are. They're paying attention. Follow the money. <laughs> yep. Follow the money. Well, as they say, it's all about the money. Show me the money. Cash is king. But those are important, very, very important pieces of advice. Um, moving on from corporate counterparty risk concerns, conversation on debt seeding, and the other kind of risk that both of you mentioned, the next story that we'd like to discuss is possibly the news of the weekend and today is JP Morgan Chase taking over First Republic Bank, which reportedly won out over as many as five rival bidders. What happened to First Republic Bank supplanting SVB as the second largest bank ever to fail? Is this another epic example of poor interest rate risk management? Is this a massive regulatory failure as well? Ben, I'm Paul. I have two questions for you. Ben, if I may take this question to you first. Why do you think First Republic Bank failed? And with the takeover of the bank by JP Morgan Chase, do you think the US banking crisis is over? Uh, well, that second point is certainly something that uh, Jamie Dimon was uh, uh, pretty adamant about. Um, so I'll probably defer to him in that regard, although, of course, he would say he would say that. I think it's just a sign that we're still in the, uh, if not crisis, the uh, certainly the turmoil that's impacting the smaller banks within specifically the US, that there's so many of them, you know, that there's so many small or regional banks all across the US that are very um, tied into their communities in a lot of regards. And that's, I think, where the worry is. It's not from your big, huge multinational banks that are that are US banks. It, it's the smaller level below. So uh, you can understand why uh, people that have money in those institutions would be uh, concerned about it and uh, would be potentially looking to see if they can uh, divest some of the cash they have in there to notionally notionally safer banks and that's the problem that you get into it can become quite a cycle of uh a run uh you know then the panic then all oh, the saviors here but then everyone's left in the other smaller banks thinking well i don't want to be kind of left holding the bag for this i don't want to be the one caught out and it's trying to weigh up that uh sort of risk management on one side but also supporting these banks that are quite important into the overall ecosystem. There's, I don't think, you know, if the US suddenly just had five banks, that's not that's not healthy. That's very uh, prone to risk, uh, much more than the diverse range of uh, financial institutions that uh, are up and down uh, the US right now. So it's certainly worrying times. I think it just proves, as I said, that we're, we're still in the situation. We're not March wasn't an isolated uh, kind of uh, 30 days of, of madness and now everything's fine. 
I think it uh, we just need to uh, for treasurers just pay attention to the situation and just make sure that again, as Paul said earlier, it's all about don't have too many eggs in one basket. You know, you've just got to make sure that you're diversifying and make sure that you really sort of understand as well what the institutions that are holding your cash are doing with your cash. You know, what what's uh, what are that where are they investing? What are they tied up in? And, you know, hopefully a lot of due diligence is done before placing significant funds with any institution. But it's just kind of having that savvy and being able to uh, make sure that everything fits into the areas that you want to be in as a treasurer. Yeah, definitely, Ben. I think those are great points. When I think about Jamie Diamond's uh, comments, he has incentive. I mean, it's the obvious thing. He has incentive to make that statement. He may be right. But he did, he did acknowledge that there, there may be some smaller banks that are yet to fail. I think that is a true statement. I not see an offhand in terms of larger regional banks that we have risk yet, at least not at this time. We'll see what happens for the remainder of the year. The Fed's decision coming this month. I do expect another rate hike that's going to put some pressure on banks. If they don't raise rates, well, that gives a reprieve for a while. And how long is that reprieve? Is it, you know, until the next Fed meeting? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I'm expecting a rate raise this next round, and then we'll see what uh, economic data says in terms of the robustness of the U.S. economy, at least from a U.S. standpoint. We have a lot of small banks in the U.S., and I can give I uh, gave this example before on another podcast, but we have a lot of small local mom and pop banks here in Iowa. We are an agriculture state. We grow corn, we grow soybeans, we raise cattle, pigs, chickens, turkeys. It's what we do here in Iowa. We do a lot of it. So we got a ton of small towns just scattered all over the place and they have a need for banks. And they're small local banks. So what are these small local banks doing? Well, they're reinvesting in their communities. So it's the health of those small communities that's going to keep those banks intact. They are they aren't traditionally doing some of the riskier stuff that the larger banks are doing. One, because they don't have the capacity and you know, they're not branching out outside the areas that they live in. So, you know, to your point, Ben having five really large banks in the U.S., I'm not even sure how that logistically would even happen. <laughs> but when I think about the health of banking, uh, we're seeing that back to, I think, your first question, regulation, was there a failure? Well, there was. There clearly was a failure in the regulation because the reported or required reporting by the banks wasn't showing the issue until – Rates started rising and people were noticing, hey, these balance sheets, they have problems, but you don't see it because we're reporting a book value on these long-term loans. It's book value. So they're not marked to market. And we've seen other instances uh, when it comes outside banks, just saying outside writ large when it comes to investments, dealing with organizations. Marking to market makes a difference, right? It gives clear visibility to what the risk is associated with the organization. If you're not marking to market, that's a problem. And that's what we've seen. It's been uncovered. And so now, you know, everybody's the regulators are stepping back and saying, hey, we got to do something. Yeah, you do got to do something. So there's going to be some regulation coming through that's going to address these issues. Yeah, you know, the banks are going to be required to clean up their balance sheets. Yeah, you know, I guess I go back to the old economic standpoint that I like the tech, which is I'm not a fan of moral hazard. It would be better if we just let them completely fail. Why? Because if they completely fail, then the public is going to clamor and require that banks do all these things. And the banks are going to react and be required to do it just by the public demand on legislators to institute 
you know, safety. And banks are going to say, well, geez, you know, we're not going to be able to take these risks that we're taking anymore, uh, or at least not as big a risk, still probably some risks in there, but not as big a ones, or as much towards this risky activity. Because if we do that, depositors aren't going to come to us. Finally, what is your choice for the biggest or most important story of the past week and why? If I may start with you, Ben. Yeah, I think it is the JP Morgan takeover of First Republic. I think that's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the big story. And it just underlines something that uh, came out in uh, first quarter um, earnings reports is that while there's a lot of stress on uh, small or regional banks, the big keep getting bigger. And uh, particularly in the, uh, in the Treasury management revenue um, stakes, uh, so, for example, uh, City Institutional Clients Group reported that the Treasury and Trade Solutions Q1 revenue was uh, 3.4 billion, up 31% year on year. JP Morgan Chase Payments reported revenue of 4.5 billion, up 72%. And Wells Fargo Corporate Investing uh, Investment Banking reported Treasury Management and Payments revenue of uh, 786 million, which was an 82% year-on-year increase. So, you know, it's it's not all doom and gloom <laughs> out there on 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 the banking streets, uh, certainly. Yeah, certainly not uh, at all, Ben. You know, I, you know, I can't ignore J.P. Morgan's acquisition either. And when I think about this acquisition, the sweetheart deal that J.P. Morgan got, you no, know, Jamie is sitting there grand near to ear because he got a he got a good deal. He got you know one time gain that's significant. He he's getting support from FDIC on losses. He's getting all kinds of things out of this. I mean, it's it's really a good deal. Why wouldn't he be happy? I'd be happy if I was him, you know. And it allowed him to go right past the deposit threshold. So, you know, you, a single bank can't hold in the U.S. more than 10% of total deposits in the U.S. J.P. Morgan now does. They're allowed to with this acquisition. So they were able to grow even more. It's like crazy, right? But... This is what we got. This is a big story. It's a big deal. Um, you know, JP Morgan just got a lot bigger. It's, it's, it's significant. JP Morgan got a lot bigger. Uh, thank you, Paul and Ben, for your discerning analysis and informative insights. We would also like to thank our CDM file audience for joining us on this edition of Open Treasury. Please subscribe and look in the show notes for the article links. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. For more information, visit ctmfile.com.